I'm trying to convey a thought pattern. It's not about the vulnerability itself. It's about the insight that got the hacker to witness or discover or exploit that vulnerability. There are other skills that make you more valuable on the market. And these skills are like about software design, software architecture. So, I mean, I couldn't put that in the book because everybody would just like, yeah, like you said, like, oh, that's nobody would do that. Well, actually. <laughs> hey everyone, David Bumble back with a very special guest. He's the author of a whole bunch of books. He has one of them, Hack Like a God. He has another, Hack Like a Porn Star. Very, very cool names, Hack Like a Ghost. And a very new one, well, here's another one actually, Ultimate Guide for Being Anonymous. And here's a very new one. I don't have the physical copy, but when you watch this, it should be available for order from No Starch, How to Hack Like a Legend. Sparkflow, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello. It's great to have you here. So um, I was going to, let's start with this. So I, I think these are the two latest books that you've got, right? So <laughs> yeah. Hack Like a Ghost and then Hack Like a Legend. I mean, maybe you can just give us a rundown of like a quick, quick, overview of, you know, what's the difference between all of these books? Because they, I, I've, I, I can't say I've read everything, but I, I really have enjoyed what I've read in each of these books. Um, I don't know if you want to start with perhaps the newest book, because this is yeah. the one that's just come out, Hacked Like a Legend. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, well, basically, the idea of all these books um, is to take the reader through what it's like to actually hack a company. So yep. it's not a list of vulnerabilities. It's not a list of a to-do list, if you will. It's rather, yep. let's get in the mind of the hacker, shadow the hacker and see what are the what are the frustrations that they meet? What are you know the technical challenges? What is what typical insight they gain or they can come up with uh, during certain situ situations? The idea is to simulate a real corporate environment. And so each of these books kind of targets a different type of company, a different type of context. So how how to act like a porn star is really, it was really the first one, kind of like uh, an experiment. <laughs> right, cool, it, cool, cool name. I mean, I was, I, I, but I, I will show you those because I actually, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to show those yeah. because um, I, I've read a few. No, I think it's the other one. The Hack Like a God. Sorry, to, to just go off on a tangent. I just wanted to show this while I've interrupted you. Um, you've got like the NSA busy opening up Cisco routers in one, in, but that's in Hack Like a God. So sorry, apologies. Yeah. Back to <laughs> Hack Like a Porn Star. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I took that one from the files leaked by Snowden, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the first one basically, Attack Like a Porn Star, really takes you through any old big company, really, yeah. uh, Fortune 500 company. They have windows all over the place. They have legacy systems. They have mainframes, they have all this kind of stuff. And it's just about like hacking them. And that was, that was really what my pen testing days looked like. Yeah. Literally, it's, uh, I mean, it's a mega scenario composed of many small scenarios. You don't need to go through the whole thing to hack a company, actually. Just a subset of it will do most of the time. But uh, but yeah, and so, and then I said like, well, okay, because when you do a scenario, you don't get to explore every variation of every vulnerability and every mistake. And so that overflow of ideas that kept and the, the stayed in my head, like I dumped it in the second book. And uh, that's how it went, really. <laughs> so your second book, which one is that one? How to Hack Like God, yeah. Great. And so, yeah, and so when I did finish those two books, really, um, I kind of explored all the basic vulnerabilities that we found in every company that we pen tested. And, and then I set myself a, a different challenge. I was like, well, you know what? All these books, we take this assumption that the company that we're trying, that, that we're targeting are really bad at security. Um, let's, for fun, imagine that actually they're pretty good. They're actually very good. Like they have detection, they have monitoring, they have, they don't have legacy stuff. So yeah, how would that work? And so that's basically the scenario behind how to hack like a legend. Um, and it's really about a hacker. I don't want to give away too much, but basically a hacker gets inside using all the traditional methods. And then suddenly they get booted out of the network and you know, and how do they get back inside? How do they manage this time to not get kicked out and so on? And it's, and it's really about like you're facing an adversarial context. Like there's machine learning, there's detection, there's monitoring, there's um, yeah. So <laughs> that's the that's the idea of that book. No, I love it because I mean the you know in YouTube videos I always get I always get this complaint. Um, David, what you're showing is is stupidly simple and unrealistic. But I mean we all know that you know some companies have great security, some have very bad security, and I, I think it's great that you're taking like a modern day example where they've spent the money and they've got good systems and how do you get around that? Yeah. And there's, I want to come back to that um, interesting remark about simple or stupid vulnerabilities. We saw some stuff in the field that is actually, that 
I couldn't put in the book because people would not believe it. Oh, come on. No, pe- nobody, would, nobody would do that. Well, you know, I'll give you an actual vulnerability. For instance, I remember like in a pen test um, one day, they asked me like, oh, can you look at this Citrix isolation kind of thing? And I'm like, wow, okay, let me see. Uh, yeah, they told me that it's very secure and it's very hard and et cetera. I was like, well, okay, I will try my best. I don't know. And and I looked at, I listed the, the users because anybody connected to the system in Windows Active Directory can list the users. And in the attributes of the users, so publicly available to anybody connected to the environment, were the actual passwords of the users. No. So, I mean, I couldn't put that in the book because everybody would just like, yeah, like you said, like, oh, it's, nobody would do that. Well, actually. <laughs> so, and I think that's what's interesting about these books, honestly. I mean, it's totally biased opinion, but a lot of the time you don't need a buffer overflow to get, to get inside a company. And I think that was the realization that I got when I started doing this pen testing work. And I contrasted that observation with what I've read before. Um, yeah. And I'm like, well, that's not what happens in the real life. You know what? Let me take a stab at it. So, yeah. So, I mean, I want to, I want to I want to ask some questions about your books because there's something that I think is really important that you highlight that a lot of other books don't. But what about Hack Like a Ghost? Because this changes the scenario quite a bit, doesn't it? Oh my god, that, that one was a pain. Uh, to write. <laughs> <laughs> that one. Well, basically, here's here's how it went through. Um, I written all these books about Windows. Um, then I got a call to change jobs. I got a call about an opportunity, and the call went something like this. So we're looking for somebody to build our security system, etc. That would mean me changing uh, literally my uh, the type of jobs that I would be. Doing. I'm like, wow, yep. okay, that sounds interesting. And they're like, well, uh, do you know AWS? Do you know Kubernetes? Do you know anything about Cassandra, Kafka? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it was interesting because I discovered this whole ecosystem of cloud environments, et cetera. I mean, that was back in 2017, right? And I realized that all the tools, all the tricks that worked in a Windows environment simply did not work uh, on this company. And I'm like, I mean, there's so much stuff to unpack. So I spent the next years actually leveling up on this. And I thought, hey, that would make for an interesting scenario because all these tech companies, I mean, nobody sets up a new you know, infrastructure. No, they just go to the cloud. All these startups, these scale-ups, and I didn't find something that was really um, good or really addressing these in the way that I imagined it. So I just wrote about it. I mean, so you've, you, I mean, you've covered, this is like cloud, so breaching the cloud. And I mean, yeah. like you say, that's so important because a lot of companies are, gonna, are, are going that route. And then here yeah, you're back to Windows, right? So yeah, but that a, was but the a modern, part of Windows, a mod, yeah. a modern version of Windows, modern system. Sorry, I, go on. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, um, the thing with technical books is that the minute you release them, they become obsolete. <laughs> and um, what I want to do, what I want to, what I try to do in that latest book, How to Hack Like Legend, and maybe in any of those books, is that I'm trying to co- convey a thought pattern. It's not about the vulnerability itself. It's about the insight that got the hacker to witness or discover or exploit that vulnerability. So I, I hope that's what readers get from these books. Um, I mean, even the modern one, like, oh, how to evade the endpoint detection response with all the machine learning and stuff. I specifically say this technique I found while researching the book or I copied or it worked when I was doing the book. But basically, uh, this is the steps that I followed. Don't hesitate to follow the same steps and maybe you could have a different result. So that was um, in How to Hack Like a Legend. Uh, it was, um, yeah. I think that that summarizes the spirit of the book. I'm trying to see which book it's in, but in one of your books, you talk about um, how frustrating it is. You love and you hate this industry. Oh, that's the that's the intro of how to hack like a uh, like a ghost, I believe. Yeah. So in hack like a ghost, you said this: the security industry is tricky. I maintain a love hate relationship with this field due in no small part to its fickle and fleeting nature. You can spend months or years honing your skills. In a particular area of security, say privilege escalation and lateral movement using PowerShell, and then only to feel completely useless when you find yourself in a full Linux or Mac OS environment or in a cloud environment, I, su- I assume. So th- that kind of highlights yeah. what, you, what you're saying, right? That was exactly my feeling when I got into that new company in 2017. Exactly. Yeah, that was day one. <laughs> so, I mean, what would your advice be to young people? I mean, is, is it just don't give up hope? Just go for it because it's changing, but you have to you have to keep learning, right? You have to keep learning. We we can go honestly, we can go different directions here. But for people basically new to the field, they feel so overwhelmed by the just the sheer enormity of all the fields. And you know, you have to dig deep in web application, network, and system, etc. And my advice is usually just pick one and dive into it. 
that's it. Pick one, dive into it until you don't like it anymore, or you just feel like your attention is being captured by some something else and then switch and so on and so forth. And after a couple of years, you'll get the hang of it. And the effort to level up will no longer be as tremendous and as big because you already have that thick base going on for you. And yeah, I mean, the people that I find are thriving in this industry industry are people who are hungry to learn. So right now I'm doing like I'm managing a team, uh, security team on the blue team side. And um, for recruitment purposes, that's the one requirement that I have. I don't care about what language do you do you know. I don't care if you know how to program. I don't care if you know how to write legal policies. I don't care about that. What I do care about is, are you hungry enough to learn? And if you see a problem, will you learn the any necessary skill to get that problem solved? If you have those two skills going for you, it doesn't matter. I mean... You don't know Python? I'm sure you'll pick it up in two weeks. Let's go. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. And it's exactly right. I mean, you can't teach someone to have that fire or that desire to want to learn. They've got to have it. Yeah. And that's that's so important. And um, and that's one of the things, that's one of the traits that I highlight in the book as well. Because as a hacker, like you don't, you can't possibly cover all the technologies. And so, you know, you come in front of Kubernetes, you don't know what Kubernetes is. Well, you know what? Download it, install it, play with it see what assumptions uh, people made that you can disprove, for instance, or that are not totally right all the time. And then there you have it. That's a vulnerability. But I love what you said. I mean, you were doing a lot of Windows stuff and then suddenly you were thrown into the cloud. And I mean, I'm sure it was painful in the beginning, like that quote says, but... um, but you picked it up and now it's just another skill you have. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, like people took a chance on me, honestly. Um, so when I, I remember that interview, I was that guy and he, ha- he asked me all these questions about all these technologies that I didn't know. And I said, well, look, I... I don't know, but here are the principles of security that I, you know, uh, that I followed in these other contexts. I didn't know this in that technology, SAP or whatever, and but I leveled up on it. And so if you give me a chance, uh, I'll do the same for AWS and other technologies. And, and it worked out pretty fine. And I mean, yeah, somebody's got to give you a chance for sure. Like I was lucky to have that. But I love what you said there, because, you know, the, I think the mistake some people make is they, when they don't know the answer, they pretend or they bluff as if they know it. And that's a big mistake. If you don't know, you don't know. You can't know everything. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that's something, that's something that I probe for in interviews, actually, when I hire people. I would just ask them like questions that, I mean, it's okay if they don't know. Like, and I asked them, like, how, how does work, Docker work? And, uh, and then like, they said, oh, it's like a virtualization. Really? Um, how does virtualization work? And I'll just probe deeper and deeper until they give up. And what I'm looking for really is just a, I don't know, give me five minutes and I'll level up or two weeks or whatever. That's what I'm looking for. And people just start making up stuff, uh, but it's okay to not know. I mean, the the interview game is such a silly game. I just got to like uh, ask the difficult question because I got the chance to go first. Like the roles were reversed. You could ask me a difficult question and I would be like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really think it's important to highlight that um, you can't know everything. And I mean, I'm older than perhaps a lot of people half my age. And, uh, you know, as soon as I remember the old days of learning, like just showing my age, you're learning Windows NT or Windows 3.11 or or whatever. And it's like, as soon as you know that stuff, okay, then it's replaced. So, you know, you you can't know everything. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to not know everything. (laughs) Now there's something in your book I want to highlight. And I mean, this might be a good place to, to, to have a good conversation is in all your, well, in not all of them, but a lot of the books you talk about the difference between a pen test and a hacker. Like a pen tester or a red teamer, if they get caught, it's like, okay, tomorrow's another day. Well done, blue team. But with a hacker, it's not like that. Yeah. Um, that's, um, that's a big difference indeed. And we felt it when, so we felt it a lot when we did penetration testing is that there is a, you don't pay too much attention to your footprint. You don't pay too much attention to anything else except the purpose of the mission. So if the assignment is about uh, replaying this or testing for this in that threat scenario, like for instance, hacking, getting into the CEO's email box, let's say, we really don't care about anything else, like hiding your IP addresses, uh, using like, you know, stealthy tool, et cetera, et cetera. Now I say generally we don't care. Some people, some teams take it to an extreme and say, oh, I don't want to be detected. I don't want to be, you know, I want to replay the whole thing. I'm going to do my own infrastructure. I mean, some people do that and good on them, um, but it's not a necessary requirement to get the job done. That's what I'm saying. And you don't have the luxury of time. Like, I mean, a hacker has unlimited 
not unlimited time, but virtually unlimited, I would say. And so they can spend so much time on something and they're not constrained by a scope because usually even in red team operations, theoretically, there's no scope, but the reality is usually there's a scope. <laughs> you should not go um, beyond that scope. And so all these exercises make it a very different, all these constraints, sorry, make it a very different, yeah, it's a different types of exercises. And it's it's necessary to be aware of these differences, especially when you're um, when you're doing assessments, when you're doing your recommendations, when you're talking with the client about all this stuff, what, what do they get from that audit? You must ensure that they are aware that, hey, you didn't find any vulnerability in these two weeks that you penetrated, yep. like in, yeah. that you tested the thing or that, um, yeah, something similar to that. Yeah, because I mean, you say here, um, a lot of people make the mistake because they, they, you say in, in um, Hack Like a Legend, um, you may be a capture the flag wizard or you may be the best arm reverse engineer, but if you don't take care of setting up a safe harbor, uh, you may not be busted today, but they're gonna maybe come after you two months or you know the countdown starts. And you, make a, you have a big emphasis, I noticed it in all the books, about setting up a infrastructure. So I wanna talk about like, you mentioned going to McDonald's or war driving, you mentioned certain versions of Linux. Uh, I wanna talk around that because I think a lot of people from what I've read you say here, make the mistake of assuming, okay, I'm going to attack this guy like a red teamer, but then they forget that they could also be exposed. Yeah. Um, I just say that basically in red team, you don't have to sit, you don't have to sit in a McDonald's just to hide your identity. It's just like, okay, you may set up an infrastructure with like on AWS or Namecheap, et cetera, but you pay for it with your own credit card or company's credit card. You don't care that much. A hacker basically, or hack, hack activists, if you will, or journalists or whatever, they have to think about this stuff and it could get very perilous for them. And so, and so, yeah, they have to think about what footprint they leave on the internet, but also physically, because usually what happens is like, you follow all these guides and they say, oh, connect to Tor, connect to like this version of Linux, et cetera. And it's good, but if you do it from your home or your university or something like that, I mean, no, you're being vulnerable. You're being Expose you one IP address away from being busted. So there's yeah, there's the physical aspect of it that you should also take care of, and uh, and obviously the money. I don't go too much into the money uh, when I talk about the uh, <laughs> in the books. Uh, purposely, I didn't want to go in that uh, like talk about Zcash and stuff like that because that would be too much. But uh, but yeah, there's all these aspects that people need to be aware of, and I try to cover them in the most exhaust exhaustive way possible in the books, just as a prelude, just to uh, set the context again and hey, this is what basically it means for a hacker to do their, their stuff, basically. So let's talk through that, because I mean, I think that's, this is gonna be a great appetizer for people who are interested in the books. Um, one of the things you say, and I mean, you mentioned it right now, is you have to be careful about your physical trail. Um, you wanna be truly anonymous. So you mentioned like war driving, can you explain what you mean by that? And you've, and then let's talk about McDonald's and some of the other options. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so it basically, so it's a very old concept, like maybe from the nineties, uh, you take your car, uh, you go around town looking for open uh, Wi-Fi's, you connect to them and you do your business. Um, that's basically what drive it. It has evolved to maybe crack in passwords of weakly protected Wi-Fi's, like if they use some weak encryption like web or something like that, or um, easily guessable WPA2 uh, password, but uh, but it, that's roughly the, uh, the scheme of it. And then you've also mentioned like Wi-Fi map, right? Yeah, there are some tools, websites that allow you to just locate these open um, open Wi-Fi networks. So you don't have to just drive and, you know, with your an antenna connected to your computer, looking for some public Wi-Fi. You're just like, oh, I'm going to target this one that is in this street, in this city. But then again, like, you got to be careful of your human nature of like going to the same place all the time because that creates a pattern. What I would usually recommend is basically just traveling around, going around cities, going around uh, different places. You have places with cameras, places without cameras. You have places with too much, with a little bit of like some, some cameras, but there are too many people. So it's okay to blend, blend in there. Uh, yeah. You have to pay attention to this stuff. And uh, yeah, sometimes it gets cold in train stations. <laughs> I think this is a great topic because a, a large part of the audience are interested in hacking and things about hacking, but a large part of the audience also interested in privacy. Um, like you mentioned, like journalists or people that want to hide what they're doing for, I mean, there's very, there's many reasons why people do this. So like you would say, go to McDonald's, like go to a train station, but like you mentioned right now, and you mentioned in your book, be careful about the human nature of going to the same place and yeah. also don't go in your own city type thing, right? Yeah, I mean, when I did like some um, basically activities that required privacy, I would say, yeah, like I would go from one place to another. I would have like a different computer, different sets of logins, be very rigorous about my activity when I was on business, uh, really. That's... 
that's the thing. Like you can't, you can't get sloppy. Means and that's why you also, don't do it at home. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that means you don't do it at home. Well, it also means that if you book like three, four hours to do your business, then you, don't, you can't go around checking your personal emails or, oh, I'm curious if that person responded on Facebook. No, you can't do that. You need to be rigorous. You need to be like very methodological and very rigorous. Yeah. So that's important. Okay. So physically you've, you're going to do war driving or go to McDonald's or go somewhere. And then you, you've you mentioned also in your um, ultimate guide for being anonymous, and I see there's, there's some correlation between these, like um, people make the mistake that they're just going to use like, and I won't mention names, but XYZ VPN and I'll be safe. Yeah. That, oh my God. There's a lot of debate about VPNs on Twitter yeah. and I have right now <laughs> yeah. time. I'm like, <laughs> so there's, a, there's people that basically VPNs have been touted as the most anonymous thing um, in the world. Like if you want to be anonymous, use a VPN. People got tired of that, I would say. And then they started to say the opposite. Oh, VPNs are worthless, are useless. And unfortunately, like all extreme positions, neither are really true. Uh, you need to reason about your threat model. Who are you protecting against? I mean, these are the two most important. There are two important questions in security. Who are you protecting against? What are you protecting? If you try to answer who you're protecting against, like let's say I'm a journalist, I don't care about like, let's say I might care about ad trackers because ad trackers get ultimately affiliated but to like, you know, exploited by governmental agencies and stuff like that. And so I would go to certain extremes. So a VPN is not good enough. I would go to certain extremes like physical security. I would go like a, a VPN. I'd go to a rebound server after that VPN, another rebound server after that. So I would chain multiple layers that way, even if one gives up, it's okay. It's not so, it's not dramatic. But as a personal, um, let's say citizen, that I, I I just don't want to be tracked by ad trackers or something. I would just Google use or, yeah. Google or Facebook or whatever. I would just use a VPN in combination with Brave, for instance. That would be enough because a lot of these ad trackers, they just base like some of them are very advanced, like Facebook, but a lot of them are just a combination of the user agent and the IP address. So if I get these two like different every time, I'm good. So, and that's the setup that I use at home. I'm always connected to a VPN. I always have Brave. I have some extensions that personal extensions, private extensions that randomize some attributes of the browser. Mm -hmm. And I have some add-ons. That's it. So just for everyone who's watching, we're not getting an affiliate fee. This is just our opinions or Sparkflow's opinion. Sparkflow, I, in your book, you mentioned Air VPN and Proton VPN. Uh, you know, I've seen those two, Air VPN specifically in a few of your books. Is that still your personal recommendation? Let's say I want to stop ads or... Is it Proton VPN? Do you have any sort of sort of recommendations or you know if people because there's a thousand out there, there's millions of you know dollars are spent on marketing. So you know what's your yeah. what's your advice? Honestly, like I I personally like Proton VPN. It's good. It's okay. Uh, it works well. It works across platforms. And so for my personal needs, for my threat model, and my threat model doesn't include the NSA going after me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So my. Threat model is simply like, you know, ad trackers that annoy uh, the hell out of me. For this kind of threat, it's okay to use, you know, Proton VPN plus add like you block your origin privacy badger and honestly and brave. And that, that keeps me going. Yeah, no, I'm just saying if the threat changes, uh, I'll consider something else. But for now, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's important what you've mentioned because it's like, what's the threat? If it's just ads from like Google, Facebook tracking you, whatever, then these tools that you've mentioned are fine. So just if so, if someone just is at the level of, okay, I'm, I just want to stop Google. I'm at home. I'm not going to go sit in a cold train station somewhere and try and like hide my identity. Then Brave, Proton VPN, and these others, which I'll list below, are, are great. Um, Going yeah, they're great. I mean, yeah, if you, <laughs> but then again, if you still use Gmail because no other email provider is good enough, I mean, <laughs> that's where, that's why it's hard to draw the line. I mean, I'm not afraid of, let's say, because uh, look, I've experimented with other Google uh, search engines. I've experimented with a lot of emails and I tried to get away from Google, but honestly, Google search is still good. Gmail is still the best. And I've tried to pay for other services and I couldn't find something that I really, really liked. And I, my default is DuckDuckGo. And when I can't find the answer that I want, I switch to Google. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I mean, Brave of their browser, uh, their, their search engine now, but I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, there's controversy about DuckDuckGo. There, well, been a bit of controversy and like Brave's okay, but it's like frustrating because Google knows me so well and knows what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's some power to customization and, and of course, of course, yeah. Okay, so let's let's take it to the to the to to the next level. Um, okay, so I want to I want to like hide. Um, and in your book, you, you talk about this fact that it's different. Hacking is totally different to red teaming because the person that you're up against might come after you. So then you go. That's when you go war driving or you go McDonald's, whatever. Um, then you mention Linux, and I believe you got two flavors of Linux that you like. 
yeah, I like Tails. I mentioned Hunix as well, but um, Tails is good. And uh, and the idea is y- you have to operate in layers. So you have your physical layer that is probably set up, like, you know, different from where you are, from where you work, et cetera. So they can tie that back to you. And then you have the system protection, you have the network protection. So the system protection is indeed like, which operating system do you use? Uh, does it store data on the hard drive? Like if they capture that hard drive, are you in trouble? And basically it's always the same question. If a layer gives up, are you in trouble? And how much trouble are you in? And it's funny because it's the same approach we use in defense. Same thing. You stack protection, detection. Oh, if this gives up, am I in trouble? And so on and so forth. So it's really the same thing. And yeah, like Tails, I mean, get a USB key, put it on the computer, and then it boots everything from memory and it keeps everything from memory. And so if something comes up, you just remove the USB key and that's it. For people who don't know about Tails, the, the idea is it's all in RAM or memory. If something goes wrong, the power's lost, it's all gone, right? Exactly. It's an operating system, it's a Linux flavor. You just put it preloaded on a USB key and then you just plug it in and you connect to this eph- uh, like ephemeral environment, I would say. And then from that ephemeral environment, you connect to your actual bouncing server, I would say. So that gateway that will allow you to access different co- other servers where your tools reside. Because you need some persistence of your tools, you need some persistence of your data that you collect. And so from that ephemeral environment, that machine, you connect to a bouncing server and from those bouncing servers, you rebound across the planet to other servers where you can store information. And I want to talk about the infrastructure. I just want to cover the basis of like, what am I doing? Because I think a lot of people watching will be really interested in this. So laptop, you take a laptop with you, you go somewhere that's not at home. Um, Then you use Tails because it's ephemeral. Uh, As soon as the power's lost, it's gone. You mentioned Tor in the book, and I forgot to ask about that. So the VPN that you'd be using, would it be Tor? Would it be like uh, one of these other VPNs on Tails? Or is there something else that you do? Either a VPN or Tor. uh, I don't have a strong opinion because either way, if you're up against the federal agency uh, in the US, I would say, I don't think either of them would really protect you. Here you have to rely on not pissing off federal agencies, <laughs> or if you do, to not be in the US. <laughs> because, I mean, and like, and, and this anonymity thing is also about decreasing the likelihood of raising your, the, the like, you know, your value in their eyes as well. Because if you had bank A, B, C, D, and you get like, you know, 800 million in your, in total, I mean, you're a big target. They, they can justify spending time chasing you and money chasing you. But if you can somehow mislead them and decorrelate the attacks, you're suddenly much less valuable. Like the, the, the person that hacked Uber, I don't know if it's the, it's the same person that hacked GTA, uh, you know, GTA 6. I would advise against that because then suddenly you're this person that actually hacked two big companies. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, I I, I, can't, I don't have it right with me now, but I remember in the book you said something along the line, one of the books you said something along the lines, you don't want to let an analyst try and like um, work out who you are and leave like a uh, like trail of who you are because then they might want to like come after you and give you like a fancy name, like Fancy Bear or something. Yeah, something right? like that. Because, because I was a digital forensic investigator. It's actually the, my first professional job. And, and when we were like researching and investigating these incidents, I mean, if you get a lead that matches another lead, oh my God, it's ecstatic. It's like all those hours are suddenly justified and you have this boost of energy that justifies going even further. I mean, it's so cathartic that, yeah, we should avoid giving people that kind of feeling. And that's why you've got tails and you do, you go from different places. So you're not leaving like sort of falling into that trap of doing things the same way over and over, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why you need to rechange, change your environment every time and make sure that it's very different. You don't work on this like, you don't use the same tricks or the same tail, tails, obviously tails, no, it? you don't use the same uh, tricks, physical I, or tricks. Yeah. yeah. You don't use the yeah. same tricks on the multiple targets. Yeah. And I, I've got, I've got, a, I mean, I believe you've got some controversial opinions, so you, uh, f- please feel free to go for it. But like you mentioned Chromebooks, aren't Chromebooks good? Ah, <laughs> no, nothing, <laughs> nothing that, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, again, it depends what's your, um, what's your, what's your threat level? Who are you protecting against? Because um, in a company, I would say, if you're protecting against outside attackers, that is not Google. I mean, it's okay. Chromebooks are excellent. But if you're going to, oh, I want to be like protected against tracking and stuff like that. No, I mean, obviously not. It's not a good. Um, so, so so again, it really boils down to who are you protecting against? What are you protecting? So Okay. So I've got a laptop. I've decided to go to McDonald's. I, um, I'm using Tails. I've got a VPN, let's say, or Tor. And you mentioned this concept of a bouncing server. Can you explain what that is? And then explain a bit about like the infrastructure that you would spin up. Yeah. So all this is, here's the thing. The whole thing about the infrastructure 
came up be- on this specific book, How to Hack Like a Ghost, is so detailed because I wanted to uh, let the reader experience what these infrastructure ad- administrators um, go through when they set up their own systems. Because there's some interesting concepts that you can borrow in the uh, and use them in the in the security field. For instance, there's this concept of um, immutable infrastructure in the sense that if you spawn a server you don't change it. You don't change its configuration. It stays there until it dies. And if you want to change something like upgrade it or do something else, you spawn another server. You need to automate that. And so I use that in the concept of security by saying, if it's easy to automate the creation and destruction of servers, then you can have the luxury of having dedicated servers per target uh, because it's so easy to manage 100 servers. It's so easy to spawn 100 servers. That's why I went into so much details about the like automation, Terraform, and all these other tools, containers, and all these other tools. And now the idea idea is you're on your computer. So you access these first layer of servers, I would say. And then from these servers, you go to, you know, different servers according to which type of operation you're doing. Are you doing fission? Are you doing like, you know, reverse shell? Are you doing uh, Nmap scan or something like that? Are you doing it on target A? Are you doing it on target B? And so that's the idea, like to have this kind of infrastructure for attack that is easily, um, yeah, configurable. So in, um, in the um, hack like a legend, you kind of build, build on this, it seems. And correct me if I'm wrong, but like you've got the target and then you've got a frontline server and that's attacking the the actual um, target, right? Yeah. And can you just like give us an overview of like how they work? So I've got a target and then I've got a, a server that's you, you've done something with in the cloud that's that's attacking, right? And then behind that, you've got something else. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. But basically, you don't want to attack your target from Tor or from the VPN because then the IP address of Tor and the VPN would get leaked in the logs of that company. And so then suddenly the network layer is down. You're like, there's one layer of protection that you use that is suddenly worthless. And so uh, if you can imagine that they would hack it or crack it or legally challenge something like that, they can get back to you. And so the idea is to add another layer simply. And that other layer would be a server. So instead of you attacking from Tor, you connect through Tor or a VPN to a server X frontline server. And that frontline server actually interacts with the target. And so if the IP of the frontline server is on the logs of the company, that's the, the rough idea. And the idea is basically you want to have a server per function. So for instance, if you start scanning from that server and that server gets down and in parallel, you're doing a phishing campaign, well, then you want to have two servers separate because if your scanning gets detected and they block that IP, you don't want that to impact your phishing campaign. And so that's the idea of modularity and resilience that you must have also on the attacker side. And you also have your command and control servers in the cloud as well, right? And they're controlling yeah. all these devices. They're controlling the devices that get pwned inside uh, the company. And the idea is, um, I would like, again, I just gave the blueprint and the thought pattern, but you can extend it. Like you can say, for instance, I did a phishing campaign and I had a couple of workstations. So I'm going to make them report to server A. They're going to contact that server A and then I can execute commands through that server A. But then I spent some time hacking other servers and it was difficult. I secured these servers. I hacked them. I got inside. Should I make them report to that server A as well? Well, it was so difficult to get into them. Now, if an analyst just like, you know, busts one of the workstations that you hacked, suddenly you lose this privileged access that you got on the server. So that's not good. So I will make the report to a server B independent of server A. And that way you can keep some resiliency. Even if you lose one uh, way into the company, you have other ways. So that's the idea, that's the general uh, concept. So, I mean, you've also got redirectors that sits between the, like the, the phishing attack, attack server, Command and control yeah. and the and the uh, and the target, right? Yeah, that's uh, again. It's just the same concept applied, you know, uh, <laughs> ad nauseum. Yeah. I would say basically, when the company when you set up that command and control, so it's a Metasploit tool or uh, Empire or Covenant or what have you. Mm-hmm. So it's a tool that controls all these zombie machines. I would say. Do you want to configure that tool thirty six times? <laughs> Probably not. So either you automate the configuration of that tool 36 times. I mean, you can do that. Or what you can do is uh, configure it once and then place in front of it multiple servers. And that way, like you, and you would do these kind of redirections. So target A will go through the redirector A and go into that framework. Target B will go through that. And then you have one console to manage all these machines. But they, like the company the different targets have the impression that they're communicating with different machines and they are, but behind the back, it's really one console. So that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that because I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned in your book or it's just me and my team discussing it. The problem with a lot of other books is they just go straight into the hacking, but they don't show you any of this stuff. And you make a big emphasis right in the beginning of your books. 
Like cover your tracks. Again, like a lot of the other books are just simply a list of vulnerabilities and simply a list of stuff like techniques that are very good. I mean, you need that. You need to absorb that, those facts. But those facts are not rooted in a context. And so the idea of these books is really to give you the full context. I mean, this is what goes in the mind of a hacker, the fear, the frustration, the joy, the anticipation, apprehension. So you actually feel it and you can understand some more like how they operate and it demystifies the whole thing, I believe. I love it. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's brilliant how you've explained it. Um, and the, I love the way that you, you shared a bit of your frustration, like learning because i think a lot of people who are beginning will feel that frustration like it's impossible to learn all this stuff um and it's only guys that like you who know everything but i'm, I'm glad that you shared you know you went for that frustration of going from say windows to a cloud environment um but it's important to do this i mean i think it's good from a privacy point of view because a lot of people are interested in privacy like i said and you know from a the difference between red teaming and hacking i'm glad you've highlighted that and let's uh let's get something else controversial in your um hack like a ghost you've got here something about um CTFs are amusing puzzles. <laughs> oh my God, talk yeah, about that? Go. Like, I gotta, I gotta, I, we gotta have something controversial. Come on. <laughs> so, what's the difference yeah. between CTFs and like real world? Oh my God! Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I wrote a book, uh, an article about this. So I did. I did a lot of CTFs. I love them. And I did them on the side. I did them before actually doing my job. But the thing is, a CTF, it's, if it's really, really good, it depends on the goal of the CTF. If the, if the goal of the CTF is to emulate real life, it will not look uh, like it looks um, like right now, really. A lot of them are based on guessing. A lot of them are based on exaggerated flaws or mistakes that are made by people. And so that's that's what I don't like, but, but maybe I just encountered like really bad CTFs, that being said. But uh, but I've seen some videos of Ipsec, for instance, he, he has a YouTube channel and he does all these hack the box, solves them. Th those are great. I love those. Those are great. I mean, you don't have to guess. There's not that much guessing going on. Like it's really about piecing the puzzles, but a lot of CTFs are just lazy. They're just like, oh, you have to guess that this thing is like that. And there's no basis of getting or justification for getting to that guess. So that's what I dislike about it. But that's it really. And, but, and yeah, in nature, it's not the same. I mean, it's like you're solving a puzzle, whereas there you're get, you get in the mind of the person who designed it and they designed it not to annoy you. They designed it because they had real constraints in the real world. I mean, uh, managing systems is tough, is really tough. And so you've got to make sacrifices. You've got to make things don't work out exactly like you thought they would. And bam, you have a vulnerability. And so getting there is not simply a matter of guessing. It's actually getting into the shoes of the person designing that system and then finding what wrong assumptions they made. That, that's the main difference. And that's why I ranted about it. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's good. It, what, what I really like about what you said now is that you said, okay, this is the problem with them. But then you mentioned Ipsic as a, as a, as a good YouTuber to go and look at. Any other like CTF? A, again, a lot of people watching might be new to the industry and then they get swept up and like, where do I go? So I'll put his links below. Um, those are good ones to watch, right? Any other like sort of ch YouTube channels or like places like articles, like have you, you said you wrote about some stuff. Is there any places that you can recommend people would go to if they want to do CTFs? So, or, you know, how do you get hands-on experience? That's a problem. Oh yeah, okay. Well, I, I can tell, I can share the story of how I did it. Um, That'd be great, it yeah. might not be, yeah, it not, might be suitable for everybody, but so basically I got out of school after years of advanced math and physics uh, and I wanted this university that, you know, the, was doing cybersecurity. So those long time ago, doesn't dozen year ago or something like that. But then I came to this university and at the end, like, oh no, cybersecurity is only six months at the end of those three years. I'm like, shit. So I skipped 60% of school and I just got books and read them, articles, blogs. And I started by learning about the systems. So a web server, SQL, you know, programming languages, C, C++, PHP, Python, all this kind of, so basically I viewed security as a layer that is put on top of these systems. Yeah. So you need to understand the systems, the network first. So that's what I did. So I spent nine months doing just that. Um, and the for the hands-on experience, it's simple. Like I would read like something about, I remember I read book about the Linux, Linux kernel structure, literally like you had structures for five pages going on. It's crazy, crazy book. Uh, and then I would just like, hey, let me look at the source code. Let me download an old version. Let me set up this. Let me set up that. Oh, I'm reading about SQL. Let me set up a, you know, 
MySQL server and play with it. Let's see. And then after those nine months, I started taking books about security. So Counter Hack Reloaded, Art of Intrusion. I started reading Frack articles. I started read, uh, watching DEF CON conferences, Black Hat. And every time I would see something, I would just take it, download it, and try to play it in a safe environment on my in my box. And that's, that's literally how it went. And then I started doing some CTFs. I liked it in the beginning, but at some point after I started working, I was like, oh man, that, this does not look like a, what <laughs> what's what I've seen in that CTF. And so that so that's the journey that I took. The, the best way to learn this stuff is to understand it. And I think that's why people who have lots of experience, it's not it's not a f- stretch to learn something else like you did because you've just got all that foundational knowledge. Yeah, and the the idea is that afterwards, like for instance, when you I like I see a new exploit or something like that, I don't start from scratch because I already have this space in there and it just like takes me 10 minutes to, I just like scroll and oh, I see what he did there, let's move on. Um, so keeping up is not such a, does not require that big of an investment in time, so. You know, I'm, I'm an old guy, but it's amazing. The world just keeps keeps reinventing stuff. Um, so if you if you've learned technology, you're just building and building. It makes it so much easier to learn newer stuff. Okay, um, so the best example is Kubernetes. I mean, it looks like a really scary te- technological component, um, but at the end, at the root of it, when you really dig into it, it's just a combination of containers, uh, capability, Linux capabilities, and um, IP tables. So yeah. So let me let me let, let me jump on that. Um, if I'm new, or I'm starting out, end of 2022 to, or 2023. What advice would you give, say, your younger self or someone like me if I was starting? I wish it, I wish it was me, but let's say it was someone young. Um, what should I focus on? Do you have any sort of recommendations from your experience? I mean, you've right. given us your like the journey you took, but like if you were starting over, don't, let's try not make the same mistakes. What would you advise me to do? Don't be intimidated by stuff. I mean, yeah, it 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 looks like everything is unreachable. It looks like everything will require a lot of work, but there's really something unique about time and the exponential nature of it. Nature of it. Like it compounds. Knowledge that you, that you gather compounds and what, you, what happens is basically as a young person, you fail to account for that. You just like do a linear progression of your skills. But the truth is it's an exponential thing. And so it's very hard for humans to grasp the power of um, like compounding. You got to bet on that. And so, yeah, read an article today, read an article uh, the next day, and then continue. And consistency is key in anything, really, in any skill. Um, just make it a habit to read something about security or do something about security every, every day, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And if you enjoy it, increase it to 45 minutes and keep going. But any technology that seems daunting, give it a go. If it's too daunting, dial it down and focus on a subset of it. So I'm going to take Kubernetes. So if you take Kubernetes, the documentation is horrible. It does not explain what it does. It starts with, at the time when I read it, it was like about mechanical, like analogies with mechanical. So I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, just explain to me what do you do simply. But no, they were like all these metaphors about how they came up with the idea and how great they are. And so anyway, uh, and... So I had really a lot of trouble with it. I'm like, okay, well, Kubernetes is what? Container orchestration. Apparently, I see this stuff coming up a lot. So you know what? I'm going to focus on a container. Okay, what's a container? Oh, you have LXC, you have, you know, container. The You know, I'm going to choose one. What's the most famous one? Docker. Okay, let's go. What do I need? The Linux machine? Okay, let's start. Docker, Google, YouTube. There's a great talk about, I think I link to it in the Hack Talk Like a Ghost that deconstructs Docker. And um, and yeah, that's that gives you the, the foundation. And let's say you deconstruct Docker and like the guy starts talking or the person starts talking about capabilities, Linux and stuff. I don't know Linux. You know what? Let me take a book on about Linux or something like that or see a conference, get enough. And it's okay if I still don't know anything about Kubernetes. I will in time, but at least I know something about Linux and containers now. That's the idea. I love that. And I think the, I think it's human nature, especially perhaps when you're younger, that you want everything. I want it now, but yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't always work that way. You've got to. It's like you said. I love what you said with the exponential. You you build, and I find, just like you said, the the longer you spend on something, the quicker you're learning that thing, and the more you can learn. Yeah, because anyway, the learning does when you sleep. Now I'm, I was reading this um, these books about sleeping and why it is important to sleep and. Yeah, the, the neural pathways like really form and get cleaned up when you sleep, and so you're not you're not gonna get it now anyway because anyway it needs to move from the hippocampus area to the long term memories. So you need sleep anyway. So so that helps. Yeah. Any hot technologies that you think I should look at? Like, is there any way that I can ride? Ride is the kind of term I like to use. Or any if you were starting like today, any, oh, yeah. like what would you focus on? How to hack like a like how to hack like a ghost? I wrote it in part because I've seen everybody focus on Windows for so such a long time, and it's because these consultancy companies 
they get hired by big corporations, Fortune 500, that don't have the skills internally. And these folks have windows, right? So, and so a lot of the talks, a lot of the like DEF CON, Black Hat, all these good conferences, uh, they focus on windows. And unfortunately, I don't see so much stuff going on in the cloud. I don't see so much stuff going on on AWS. Like AWS, uh, the, like the new Gartner was out and it's again, like leading, uh, the leader in the market. And Microsoft tries to do something in the cloud, but you know, it's... It's not as good, it's not as secure, and it's not as professional, I would say. Like right now, like if I was speaking to somebody who was just starting in security, I was like, Dude, your resume looks good, but I want to see more cloud. I want to see more, if you want to work with us, like a scale up kind of thing, I want to see more cloud. I want to see more containers. I want to see more. That's really what I uh, what I would advise people. But if you want to work for a big company that has like, you know, Windows and you want to work in that environment, of course, like go Azure, go Windows, go. But just determine what you, like what gets you off. Yeah. And oh, if you want to go with mainframes, please go ahead. I mean... <laughs> There's enough room for you and enough pay for that. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic world. Yeah, I think I think you hit it on the head there. It's um, in life you've you've got to do what you enjoy as much as you can. And if you prefer Windows, then do that. If you prefer mainframes, then do that. Find what excites you because it's a you know your your career isn't six months. Yeah, exactly. And the the <laughs> I mean the frustrating thing with like young people starting out, they're like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. Well, I don't know what my passion is. Well, try something. <laughs> Here's a thought. I mean, try something. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But at least give it a try. I tried. I tried doing sailing. I didn't like. I didn't like it. It was just too much trouble. But then I tried other hobbies and I got into it. I tried do, doing hardware hacking. I so bad at hardware hacking. By the way, it was not for me. I was like, that's that's it, and I'm okay with that. Uh, at least I tried it. I have my own opinions, and I moved on to something else. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's so it's so vast. It, you can become an expert, like just like you were saying, you were expert in say Windows, and then you had to like relearn for the cloud. Uh, you could do the same with hardware. There's so many. There's so many areas, and um, the field is so vast, and so many opportunities. Um, I wanted to. Did you want to talk more about that? I'm going to talk about just a little bit about email, and then we'll wrap it up. I want to talk about an important skill to have. A lot of people they focus on the cybersecurity thing, and they like they go all the way down, like hacking, security, reverse, etc. But the thing is, there are other skills that make you more valuable on the market, and these skills are like about software design, software architecture, distributed computing, all this kind of stuff. And it's very good, like go, like it's like a T, you can imagine like you go that deep down on another subject, but if you have like thick, a, t a thick T like on the sides, uh, you can you can be very, very valuable. And um, not enough security people talk about this kind of like peripheral thing that you can go into. Um, there was one guy like, I think Halver Flake that went from security to optimization. I was like, that's a very good move. Like you have this guy that's very expert in security and now does like very expert in performance and optimization. And it also makes your recommendations more valuable as a pen tester. So it's easy to say, oh, just do that. Just patch systems. No, it's not easy. Yeah, Shut exactly. Up. No, it's not easy. I like patching break stuff because vendors are lazy because there's no accountability because they just ship stuff like versioning is not a thing that is like i've seen i've upgraded once a system from a minor version like a minor version of a system that should be like 100 percent compatible it broke the whole production and so what is more really critical this risk of unavailability from a patch or from from a broken patch or the risk of that you know xss being uh, exploited that's a real trade off that gets that has to be done and you need to be kind of an expert in knowing how to do a patch and knowing how to do stuff so yeah it, it gives you more credibility in the field if you actually know all this other stuff related to the computer science world that's yeah that's the tangent i would say no i mean that, that's i think let's talk about that i mean okay so how do i like are there any specific skill sets or any like areas you think or any certs or how, how do i get that knowledge like you say it's important what do, what do i do so i've seen a lot of people that uh, a lot of security people are very good at scripting they don't take the time to be really good developers or really good software architect um people or designers or something like that and these these are interesting skills or just get into the production environment i mean try to run machines try to ensure their availability. Yeah, like solving these simple questions is not easy. Patching, firewall rules, et cetera, it's not that easy. That's what I was thinking mostly about. So would you say they need to spend time like on the blue team or at least like just in, before you, don't just be like red team slash hacking. You need to spend some time like learning what actually happens day to day. Yeah, in the production environment. Uh, that, that's, that. Like, I mean, you don't need to, but it's a val it makes you valuable in the market, I would say. 
um, like there's an interesting book called Designing Data Intensive Applications that gives you, for instance, all these databases and how they work and how indexes work and how, you know, uh, you reach consensus through some protocols like craft protocol, et cetera. And incidentally, that's been used by Kubernetes, like the ETCD database that's been used by Kubernetes, et cetera. And it makes you more credible, again, when you talk about this stuff, like when you say, oh, I don't know, let's do, oh, let's take that one. Um, I want to filter outgoing traffic from all my applications. I mean, that's a recommendation that is often made by a lot of security experts. Why don't you just filter all the traffic that is going out of your servers? That's easy. A server does not make a connection. It usually receives one. Why don't you filter? Well, it's not that simple. You have like plethora of providers that you need to handle. How do you handle change management in that, in that time? Like I'm a developer. I want to introduce a feature. Now I need to wait for you to whitelist that stuff. And how can I test it and understand that the error that I get is really related to a filtering rule that I forgot and something like that. So there's really that whole ecosystem of how can you properly put security in place. And for that to work, you need to understand all these facets uh, of the computer security world, uh, computer world, sorry, outside of computer security. And that's why a lot of security fails in companies, really. Security stays in their corner. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think, I think it's valid because I mean, it's easy to say, just do this, do that. But if you don't understand the consequences of what you're actually asking, I, sp I interviewed, um, I interviewed Tanya, who um, she acts purple, and she was complaining about, you know, red teamers or you know hackers coming in and and like obliterating the code of developers, and then saying, oh, you need to fix it. And it's like, do you understand what you're asking that developer to do? It's so hundred percent right. In my team, we have a philosophy: is you cannot point a vulnerability if you're not part of the team that is fixing it. I don't care. If you say, oh, but you need to learn Haskell. Yeah, go two weeks. There you go. <laughs> you need to learn how to <laughs> test an application. I don't care. Make it happen. Man. But uh, but yeah, no, it, she's 100% right. Indeed. Um, it's so easy to write a one-line doc like recommendation that says implement this kind of countermeasure. It's very hard to actually implement it, test it, do the quality assurance test, understand the business impacts of it all, and the pro productivity loss that may happen from employees having to do that extra step in order to comply with that security requirement. So is it really worth it? I don't know, but you need to figure that out. But I mean, I think what, if I understand you correctly, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I if, if I take the time to understand that, I suddenly become much more valuable to a company because just to point out a problem doesn't really help me as a company. I need to know how to fix it and not impact the business, right? Exactly. Uh, that's why a lot of security fails. It's because it's they're in this audit mode. I'm going to audit stuff. I'm going to hack stuff. Because security is really rooted in that hacking mindset. So I'm going to point stuff. I'm going to do my job. And I'm going to point all the vulnerabilities that plague the company. Yeah, that has zero value. Sorry to say. You need to fix stuff. You need to help fix stuff. Otherwise, you're just a guy shouting from the sidelines. And that's not good. So do you see in the coming years that it, it changes from like becoming purple? rather than like red and blue. Do you think it's going that way or is, is that something that needs to happen? Um, so I'm currently writing a book about it. Good. Yeah, you, 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 I saw you on Twitter, you wrote about a book. Can you tell us more about what's coming? Oh my God. It's, a, <laughs> that's the first time I talk about it. It's the, the idea, it's the, basically it's the story of a security engineer that joins a company and it's about destroying all these myths in the security world that you need user awareness, that somehow user awareness is effective. I'm saying this in the user cybersecurity awareness month. So take that. Yep. So that use the idea that user <laughs> awareness is the magical bullet that everybody's been waiting for. No, it's not. It's useless. Let's move on. The idea that, you know, um, that it's easy to do this kind of patch and this kind of stuff. The idea that TLS vulnerabilities are such an important thing. No, it's not. As a company, it's not. I don't care. Um, so all this kind of stuff. And I just put it all in context and I blur it out all these controversial takes. And I mean, yeah, the, the ISO 27K, don't bother me with these norms. I don't care. Um, so all this kind of stuff. And it's and it's made in a, in, contrary to the other books, like the other books were just like the reader and the hacker. Here is the reader, the security engineer. And the ecosystem of a company. So you have the compliance officer, you have the CTO, you have the you know the unfriendly developer who doesn't want to touch its co like their code. You have the friendly guy. So yeah, it's uh, it's it was challenging to write. It took me a year and a half or something like that. But yeah, it's I think it's important that you're highlighting this. And um, I, I think what I really liked one of the things. I mean, there's many things, but one of the things I really liked about the books that I've got here is you you make this point that. It's fine to hack, but then they could come after you. You've got to build this stuff, and a lot of other books don't talk about it, you know. And I think you're highlighting again another problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, in the in the security enterprise world, yeah, yeah, I have a lot of built up frustration about a lot of stuff that I see <laughs> and, and read, and and I mean, I just like I as I started writing this Substack just to shout and just to like let it out. So yeah, 
We'll see. <laughs> oh, we're looking forward to that book. Any sort of ETA of when it'll be a, when it, when it, when it'll be released? Oh, probably by end of the year. Oh, so it's not that long. So end of twenty twenty two, right? Yeah. Sparkflow, I really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience, especially with people who are new to the industry and encouraging people who are new not to give up um, and giving them some ideas and things to think about. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to share or talk about? No, I think we covered it pretty much. Thank you very much for the insightful questions. and for <laughs> Yeah, really loved it. Thank you. Now, thanks so much for taking the time. And um, hopefully we can get you back. Maybe when your next book gets released, you can come and um, rant. I love rants, so come and rant about it and why <laughs> it's so important that everyone read it. Sparkflow, thanks so much. Thank you very much. 